Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today in our nonprofit success series, where we are talking about our end of year giving strategy. My name is Diana Otero. I am one of the product marketing managers here at Bloomerang. Prior to coming to Bloomerang, I served on the board of the Nantahala Hiking Club, one of the 31 trail maintaining clubs of the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, which is a nonprofit organization driven and powered by volunteers. Before we start today, I have a question for everyone. I want to ask you, how does your organization handle year-end appeals and giving? So perhaps your year-end appeal is notably different from appeals throughout the year, or your year-end appeal is the same as your appeals throughout the year. Or maybe you don't do a year-end appeal, or you do something else entirely. And if you do that, um, let us know in the chat. I'll give a couple of seconds um, to let folks um, answer the poll. All right, so far it's looking like 65% of you um, or 64% of you um, treat the year-end appeal notably different from appeals throughout the year. 23% um, treat the year-end appeal the same as appeals throughout the year. 11% don't do a year-end appeal and 2% do something entirely different. If you'd like to chime in and let us know what that is in the chat, please let us know. Or if this is your first year to do a year-end appeal as well, let us know in the chat too. So here is our agenda for today. First of all, we are going to need to determine your end of year fundraising goals. And knowing what you've raised and how much you still need to raise is going to be really important and can really do a lot in determining strategy. We're going to talk about year-end mailing appeals and follow-ups and also year-end email appeals and follow-ups. Some people treat this the same and some people do different strategies. So we'll kind of talk through some different ways to handle that. We'll talk through some matching gift asks. I think this is something that is overlooked at the end of the year quite a bit and can bring in quite a lot of money really close to the end of the year without a lot of work. So we'll build out a report for that and we'll talk through that strategy. We're gonna jump into Bloomerang to see how we can implement all this and set it up for success now instead of when gifts start coming in. We're also going to talk about the biggest giving days of the year. So typically that's Giving Tuesday, December 30th and December 31st. I know Giving Tuesday is already done, but there's still some things you can do now to get you set up nicely for end of year giving. And then we'll talk about holiday messaging and stewardship, and we'll have some Q&A and some resources at the very end. Everyone is going to receive an email with a link to the recording and the slides. Um, all of the resources will be linked in the slides, and you'll all get a copy of that. I see some folks chiming in chat to say that this would be their first year to do um, a year and appeal. And they have a question for everyone. Um, oop, I misread that, not a question. There's never been anyone in place to develop fundraising up, up until now specifically. So great. We hope that you'll find some great tips um, in today's webinar. So let's get started. In terms of determining your year-end fundraising goals, the easiest way to do this is to figure out what's left of your annual campaign goal. That's just saying what, whatever the goal was at the beginning of the year, minus the money that you have already brought in. If you're using Bloomerang, you can absolutely use the campaign progress bar if you, that, if you set that up for your annual campaign this year. I will note, and we'll go into this more when we jump into the database, that campaign progress bar is going to show you what is raised. And Bloomerang, and some definitions here, raised is donations plus recurring donation payments plus pledges, not pledge payments. 
Revenue is money that has already come in, pretty much the same as raised, except instead of counting the pledge amount, you're counting the pledge payments. So if somebody pledged, for example, uh, $5,000, that's raised. And if they've made a $1,000 payment, that's revenue. I'll show you how you can pull that into reports to give you a better idea of where you are and make sure that you're really aiming for that goal that you have left of that here um, of your or of your annual budgets. You can also use your development plan keyword here. If you, if you don't have one, we have resources and we have a class specifically on that. You can use your development plan if you built one out to know how many appeals are left in the year and what has been planned for already. Part of that will be about being aware of when your due dates are, who's going to be in charge of that, who's making the changes on your website, what expectations you have for staffing, making sure that your staff is staggered for being off at the end of the year, and also that everyone's getting time with their families at the end of the year as well. And then making sure that everybody, your staff, volunteers, your board, know what your stewardship plan is for the end of the year. Making sure that you have a plan out for who is thinking who will be and who will be participating in that stewardship is going to be really important and can really set the tone as you're going into the last couple of weeks here as we ramp up towards January. I've said it before and I'll say it again, stewardship should never be an afterthought. So that should be Definitely be part of your planning when you are building out what all your organization is going to be doing at the end of the year. And you should have a solid plan in place. If you've never had a stewardship plan, this is a great year to start. It's never too late to start it, but you should definitely start it sooner rather than later. And if you do already have a stewardship plan in place, Feel free to share it in the chat if you, or if you have favorite resources that have helped you build your stewardship plan, please share that in the chat. I know that new endeavors can be really overwhelming, especially for our smaller shops. So if you have a great plan in place already for your stewardship, let people know and then they can adapt that for themselves. Going into your mailings and appeals. So with mailings, you need to remember that this is your last big ask of the year. It may be a series of last big asks, and perhaps you may have already even started that maybe some people are receiving all or only some of your appeals going towards end of the year, depending on how you're setting that up. But you need to make sure that the people who are receiving your mail appeals are frankly worth the money to send the postage. The worth the paper or paying a mail house if you're doing that, all of that time and energy and resources that go into it. I've given some examples here of who should be in line for your paper receipts. The first one is LIBENT donors. LIBENT stands for last year, but unfortunately not this year. Those are donors who gave last year, but they haven't given this year. They're typically low hanging fruit. They've given before, they're knowledgeable about your organization, and frankly, it's pretty top of mind. You can then also set additional parameters. This will be different for every organization. So for example, given in the, le in the last X number of years, perhaps some people say three years, some people say five years. It kind of depends on the size of your database, the size of your organization, and what your donor makeup looks like. Also, you can take a look at people who have given certain dollar amounts that can really be great segments for receiving mail appeals. So if you're going to be asking your major donors to make another gift, you'll need to set out what a major donor is and then how much additional you're going to ask. Or maybe you're going to ask the people that are really close to being cumulatively what you would consider to be a major donor. Maybe it's everyone who's given over X amount of dollars already this year, whether it's a major donor or not, but you've decided it's worth the postage, the mail house, the paper, the ink, the everything else that goes into it. For your mails, you want to make sure that there's a remittance envelope in there so that it's easy for them to fill out and mail back their check or cash or credit card information. I also recommend adding a link to your website. I know they can't click on a link on a letter 
on a physical letter, but there will be people who would rather just sit down and give a, give a gift to your donate page. Or if you have that ability, I have a link um, in the resources, put a QR code in there. 54% of donors prefer to give online and 25% of donors give through a mobile device. So make sure that they have, they have that and they don't have to really search around your website to get there. I'm seeing a lot of nonprofits use these QR codes really successfully that donors can scan with their phone and make a donation easily. So take advantage of that. Um, the organization that I'm with right now, um, we're doing a fundraising campaign for our local veterans of foreign wars. We ha we've had great success with the QR codes. So I suggest um, trying that. As for your messaging, you need to say something that you haven't already said. I'm gonna say that again. You need to say something that you haven't already said. We're back to this, you know, we try to be creative, try a new approach. If you've done, for example, really emotional all year, maybe do something really hopeful and joyful. If you've done the hopeful and joyful, maybe talk about the goals you haven't met yet this year and get them excited about helping you meet those goals. This is going to look different for every organization, depending on how you communicate with your donors and what you know works with your donors. You know your donors best, so think about what historically in the past has worked for your donors. So that's kind of what we're looking at for that appeal here. You need to decide who's getting your paper mailings, and you need to decide what you're going to say as a part of that. With your follow-ups, I recommend keeping follow-ups really short and simple, especially if you're already doing a really nice appeal letter. Maybe consider a postcard. It's less money than sending another big letter, or maybe include a bunch of pictures, this time with minimal amounts of text. They've already received your big long letter. What they just need is a reminder to give. So again, make sure your URL is in there or QR code, and be really consistent with the messaging. Whatever you did with your main letter, just piggyback off of that for your follow-up. We get asked this question a lot um, in Bloomerang, whether or not printed or um, handwritten is best for the follow-ups. You're just asking the people who haven't given yet to give. Some people find that doing a handwritten follow-up is more effective than doing another printed letter of some sort. You can kind of play with that. You can try, for example, half printed, half handwritten, if you have the staffing to do that. A big theme that you're going to see here as well is we have some recommendations for you, but really you want to tailor this to what works for your organization and only you can answer that. If you have the bandwidth to do some handwritten stuff, go ahead and do that. If you're not sure, or if you've never tried it before, so you're not sure what your constituents will respond to, now might be a good year to experiment as well. So again, but make sure either way, make sure that your URL is in, URL is in there. So some, some um, nonprofits, what I've seen them do as well is, they will have their board members call and follow up with their major donors or high level staff. Um, again, follow up through phone calls or personal emails. There are a bunch of different options on how to do your follow up. We'll also take a look at the reports that you'll need. For the appeal, it's anyone who you've decided to include. And then the follow up is going to be that list minus anyone who's already given. You'll want to build these reports no matter what database you're using. You can even use Excel if you're not using a database, but I'll show you how easy it is to build these reports in Bloomerang. And then now use those reports in your letters and emails. Once you've built those reports, you don't need to rebuild your filters in your letters and emails. There's an easy way that you can reference reports you've already built. Sometimes I like that better because the report gives me a full list or a full view and I can still massage the report as I'm deciding what those segments and what those thresholds are. And then once I have that set, then I can just reference them in a letter or email. Now, for your email appeals, you're going to see this is 
working pretty much exactly like your mailing list. But what I recommend is if you have long past donors that you would like to reach out to, but they haven't given recently, consider sending them, consider sending them an email if you have their email address. Also, for everybody that you would normally send a paper mail to that you don't have their email address or don't have their address, I should say, make sure they're getting that email. Your audience is going to be the same parameters that you've picked for your paper appeal if they don't have an address. And then you're also going to send to people who are in your Cybunt report. So Libunt was last year, but unfortunately not this year. Cybunt is some year but unfortunately not this year. So they have given at some point in the past, it doesn't matter how long ago, and you can set that threshold if you want, but not in the last year or not in this year. You can go in and exclude your Libent report from your Cybent report as well, since the Libents are already getting your paper appeals. We'll show you how to do that in Bloomerang. And then you have that list of people who haven't given in past years, right? they're not necessarily low hanging fruit. They're kind of those long shots. So instead of spending on postage to reach out to those long shots, you're still messaging to them. Hopefully they'll respond via email and you can get that relationship and stewardship going again. And you'll still be able to pull in some money without spending any. Make sure you know, that, that your messaging is pretty much identical to your paper appeal. So you're really just writing one appeal letter. You're just sending it two different ways. For your follow-up, again, you can play with this and do it a couple of different ways. Make sure that it's short. Some people will send an email, and if they have an address, they'll follow up with a postcard or with a letter. That's absolutely fine. Most people will just send a second email on top of it or make some phone calls if you have the numbers. And then make sure that you're linking straight to your giving page. Always make sure you're linking to your donation pages. And of course, you want that follow-up email to be the same as your follow-up letters, postcards, phone calls, however you're handling that. Make sure that your messaging is consistent throughout. And then the reports needed. So again, that would be anyone you've decided to include. And for the follow-up, it's the same list minus anyone who's already given to the year-end appeal that you're talking about. I want to give you a little bit of a formula here for some easy solicitation. Um, as much as we say, you know, you really want to personalize this, that lies this, I'd like to say this is an easy solicitation formula. This is just one formula that you can follow. This is not the formula to follow. But if you haven't tried this, consider this. So this is really just the outline, bare bones. Make it your own, of course. But the first thing you should really be doing is establishing or re-establishing your donor's relationship to the organization. Make sure they remember why they're giving or what they or why they've given in the past, what they're doing and how they matter as a part of your organization. You also do need to remind them of your mission. Missions are really important because people re really get a lot of impact out of that. And they can really start to understand what their money is doing and where it's going. Talking about programming is great but making sure they understand at the end of the day what your goals are is really what's going to drive them to decide, yes, this goal is important. Yes, what they're trying to achieve is important and they want to be a part of that. Gift impact statements can be really helpful, especially at the end of the year, so that donors understand what certain amounts of money can do for your organization. This is harder for some organizations than it is for others, but you can phrase it in a way, you know, if you say $5 will buy um, meals for 12, 12 shelter puppies, you're not saying that their money is going to buy meals for those 12 puppies. What you're saying is that's the kind of impact it can have. I do want to give a little bit of caution here. Be careful in your wording that your impact statements are not really limiting their gifts and making those funds restricted. It's just what kind of things you do with different levels of money and the kind of impact it can have. 
saying giving us give us money is great saying $25 is really going to protect children those are really different statements and saying what it's going to do and how it's going to impact these children's lives these animals lives your students lives whatever type or kind of nonprofit you have relate it back to that and then finally ask them for their support one thing that I would avoid using is the line, we couldn't do this without you. Because unless this is your first year as an organization, you've potentially been doing it without them, especially if they're on a LIBENT or SIBENT report. That line can feel a little bit trite and it could seem a little disingenuous to a lot of people. So make sure that you're just being direct and asking them for their support ask them to support your mission, ask them to help you achieve your goals, ask them to really make sure that their dollars have real impact at the end of the year. And that's the formula. Like I said throughout here, tell the story, make it really interesting, make, it, make them want to read that next paragraph. That's really how you're going to ensure that your donors are really bought in and they want to give. let's talk about matching gifts. So right now we're, we're focusing on employer matches. That means matching gifts are simply monies that an organization gives that add to the initial donation that, um, uh, that an employee makes. It can improve the impact of the donor's dollars. You'll want to soft credit these gifts back to the individuals to make sure that they're getting credit for having brought in that money. They're not getting tax credit for that donation. You wanna make sure that you're separating out separating out how that's labeled. If they gave 100 and then their employer matched that 100, they're, get, they're not getting a tax receipt for 200. They're getting a tax receipt for 100, but they're getting acknowledged for having brought in 200. Soft credits are the best way to handle that in Bloomerang and in most software that you might use. And the nice thing is you can reference making a matching gift in your year-end appeals. You can absolutely please, please talk about that. And then when, and then one of the reports that we'll build out together will be a nice little mailer that you can do for anyone who has already told you who they work for and ask for those matching gifts. And I'll explain a little further when we get there, how to use that. As I mentioned, this brings in more money with really minimal effort. You're not the one doing the legwork to get that money from the organization. Your donors are but making sure that they really feel that mission and are really passionate about the work that you're doing. If their employer will match gifts and um, making sure that they're really bought into what you're doing will ensure that they're asking their employers to come back around and match the gifts to you so that their impact is greater. Before we hop into the database and the demo, I want to talk a little bit about some database setup. So potentially, you only need um, really one appeal, or maybe you, you might need more than one appeal. So we've, I've given some examples here. So we have our year end appeal, Giving Tuesday appeal, if you participated in that, and um, New Year's Day appeal or New Year's Eve appeal potentially, and then your matching gifts appeal. A note on campaigns versus appeals. Your campaigns are overarching efforts. In Bloomerang, we recommend making campaigns for things like your overall dollar goals for the year, large events, capital campaigns. Those are the three main types of campaigns that you're typically going to have. Appeals are ask, um, and the way that the money is coming in. So asking for a Giving Tuesday gift for most organizations is going to be an appeal, unless you're doing a multi multifaceted Giving Tuesday approach with multiple layers of asks and a whole bunch of information on your website, letting the, your donors know about your progress and all that and trying to get organization matches. If you're doing that, that's a campaign. If you're doing more of a one-off, a, a Giving Tuesday or a Giving Day um, for your specific state, for example, that should be under appeal. Same thing with matching gifts. Same thing with your end of year letter. So we're kind of talking magnitude here. Set most of those as appeals. 
If you're doing something larger, a great argument can be made for creating a campaign. But in most cases, you're going to set up all of your end of year asks as appeals. Um, and I know Giving Tuesday has passed. And before we jump in the, into the demo, let me know in the chat um, if you participated in Giving Tuesday this year and if you um, incorporate your Giving Tuesday asks within your end of year appeal. I'm just curious because some of you may have already participated in Giving Tuesday, but I wonder how are you using your Giving Tuesday um, campaign or appeal to lead into your end of year giving? I'm seeing some answers coming in here. Giving Tuesday was the kickoff of our end of year appeal. Yes, Giving Tuesday, yes to Giving Tuesday, but not coordinated with end of year appeal. Yes, part of giving, yes, part of end of year. Yes, part of end of year. We did not participate in Giving Tuesday. We did participate in T Giving Tuesday, did not participate. Giving Tuesday as a lead in. No to Giving Tuesday, it's oversaturated, but we do our own day of giving. Yes, use it as our kickoff. Did not participate, use it to launch end of year. And didn't do it this year, but will be part and will lead into end of year in the future. Lovely. So, and that's okay, right? Whatever you did for your organization, that's totally fine. What I'm trying to get at here is whether or not you participate in Giving Tuesday, if you do participate in Giving Tuesday, that is an opportunity to use that to lead in to your end of year giving. Um, or if your giving day um, falls around the same time of the year, again, fold that into your end of year giving strategy. So you're getting those multiple touch points with your donors and potential donors and everything flows together nicely. Wonderful, okay. So let's get into Bloomerang and we'll show you some of the reports and some of the setup that I was mentioning. I know we're going to talk about a lot of reporting today, but that's really kind of where everything starts before you even, um, or once you've written your appeals, um, you need to now look at your segmentation and how you're going to message out to those different segments. So right now we're on the dashboard and we're here in Bloomerang. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to set up appeals. So my organization here, where I'm going to go to settings, transactions, and then appeals. So my organization here, we did do a Giving Tuesday appeal. We also have a year-end appeal. I already have a matching gift appeal as well. I just have matching gift. I don't have the date or date range specified because that's something I want to be able to do year round. So that's another thing to think about with your organization. Is this something that you're going to do year round versus a specific um, drive toward the end of the year? So if you want to add, just click new, name your appeal, save it, and it will be available for you to use. So I'm going to use the ones I've already created. And if you need to go in and set your campaigns as well, you can do that under transactions and under campaigns. A big determinant that will help you or a big factor that might also help you decide if you're creating something as a, as a campaign or appeal is that you can view campaign progress on the dashboard that's not necessarily available for appeals. You can still report on both of them, but for campaigns, you can easily track your progress on the dashboard. So if you need to, go ahead and set your campaigns as well. And then I wanted to show you as well where on the dashboard you might see your campaign progress. So I just clicked my update 
button here just to make sure I have the most up-to-date information. And if I scroll down a little bit, you can see I'm displaying multiple campaigns here. I have my annual campaign, Giving Tuesday campaign, and I have a capital campaign going on. We've been blessed that we've been able to reach our annual campaign and Giving Tuesday campaign um, ahead of the end of the year. What I like about this as well is there is a link here to view the transactions. So if you want to see all the transactions that came in as a result of that campaign, you can just click view transactions. It will take you to a report with the filters already applied. So you don't have to um, build the filters yourselves. Also, if you hover um, over the bar, it will show you the actual dollar amount. This is also something I like um, monitoring on our mobile app. So if you're using Bloomerang if you, and you have the mobile app, you can just swipe down to refresh that information and you can track that um, progress on your phone as well. This is especially useful for, for the times where you have a specific giving day. I'm not just, um, I'm not just continually refreshing my phone to see our campaign progress, but if you have those giving days or those end of the year where you know or you anticipate um, gifts coming in that day, you can monitor that in real time through the Bloomerang mobile app. And another thing I wanted to point out here is I talked about some terminologies earlier, raised and revenue. So these numbers are reflecting raised. So that's your donations, the pledges, not the pledge payments, as well as the recurring donation payments. Okay. Now, we have a great question here from Rebecca. Are you treating give, Giving Tuesday as a campaign or appeal to have results appear on the dashboard? Um, in order for the results to appear on the dashboard, it does have to be a campaign. So um, in my pretend database here, I'm using Giving Tuesday as the campaign, but really what I'm doing is using Giving Tuesday as a lead-in to my end of year. So you could also just name that end of year this is your end of year campaign, um, if that's more appropriate for your organization, especially if you're not participating in Giving Tuesday. Great question. Now, if I wanted to see um, what's come in, I'm going to go to um, a transaction report and add some columns just to illustrate as well um, the different amounts that we're talking about. So right now we're going to build a report from scratch. We do have some report, some templates as well. We'll take a look at that um, a little bit later. But right now, we are um, just creating transaction uh, transaction report. I can add some extra columns. I can also add um, um, any filters that we have. So right now, um, this just shows all the different transactions in my database. I'm going to leave that as is for now but I wanted to show is the different amounts. This really allows you, and you can see that there's different amount fields, and this really allows you to drill down into what amounts would you like to see. So I'm going to include raise and revenue and add those two columns. And just so it's a little bit easier to see, I'm gonna move that closer to each other, take out these other um, columns, so we have amount, raised amount, and revenue amount. So when you're talking about your fundraising goals, you're, you're of course talking about um, dollars that you need to be coming in to meet those goals. You decide within your organization what counts towards your goals. So amount here in Bloomerang is this is just everything that came in, right? These are your donations, your pledges, your pledge payments, your recurring donations, your soft credits. That's just everything. Versus you'll see here the numbers are quite different if you looked at if you look at raised or revenue amount. Um, your raised amounts are counting your donations, pledges, and recurring donation payments. Your revenue amount is counting donations pledge payments and recurring donation payments. So the big difference between the two is you're counting whether or not you're counting your pledges, that would be raised, or you're counting your revenue, that would be pledge payments. So when you 
think about what are your year end goals. Um, decide within your organization, are we looking at pledges versus pledge payments? I know that some nonprofits take a look at the actual pledge payments because pledges doesn't necessarily, when someone makes a pledge this year, um, you don't necessarily get the full amount this year. That could be realized over a number of months or even years if, if it's a multi-year pledge. So what for you counts as meeting your goal? And that will help you determine what the data that you need in your report is. And, now, and then you can take a look at some filters as well. Um, of course, a big thing that you're looking at earlier, I mentioned this is just everything for all time, but taking a look at the year. So you can put your date in there. And you have several different date options that you have as well. So for example, you can click on last week here and you can see all the different um, date options available for you. Depending on what you're taking a look at as well, your data could change. For example, are you taking a look at calendar year versus fiscal year? So if you want to take a look at fiscal year, you can say this fiscal year. And fiscal year goes by what you have told the database or what, it, what you've put in the system in your or in your settings as your fiscal year start date? Or are you taking a look at calendar year? Now, depending on your, your organization, that might be different as well. The nice thing about these two is these are dynamic filters. So if I say this year, that's going to depend or that's going to change depending on when I run the report. If I run this report today, it's going to show me 2022 results. If I run the report a couple of years, uh, sorry, a couple of years, a couple of weeks from now, it's going to show me 2023 results. So that way you can reuse the same report knowing that the date range is going to be dynamic. You do have options if you want that locked down to specific date range, you can just change this to between and put in the actual dates. Now that means when, whenever you run the report, it doesn't matter. The results are gonna stay the same for the date range that you specified. So when you're reporting, it's important to take a look at that. So you know what you're looking at and you know you're looking at the thing that you really want. So that's just your basic um, transaction report that's gonna pull in everything. So if you wanted to communicate with these um, donors from 2022, you can absolutely use this. Maybe not, um, not necessarily as an ask again, if, if uh, the date range that they gave is pretty recent. But for example, um, we mentioned earlier that you may want to reach out to donors who you know, want to give them a little nudge um, at the end of the year to reach a certain amount threshold, you can filter this in conjunction with amount to get them to that level. Um, I won't save this report for now, but another report that I wanted to show you all are our LIBUNT and SIBUNT reports. So in Bloomerang, we have templated reports that are already built out for you, which can be really helpful when you're just trying to get a snapshot of who you're looking at, or if you want to use a LIBUNT or SIBUNT report to be able to reach out to your donors. All of these report templates can still be built from scratch, but the templates have pre built in or pre-populated filters and columns that we suggest and we think will be helpful for you. And of course, everything is still fully customizable. And we always recommend it. use the report templates as a starting point and really customize it for what fits your organization. Right now, let's take a look at our LIBUNT report. And what do these filter mean? filters mean? So if we look at our include, this is looking at anyone who's given a revenue amount of at least a penny um, of, on this um, fiscal year. So again, if you want to change those date ranges, these are pre-populated. If you want to change those date ranges, you absolutely can. The reason we're going by revenue amount here is, you know, if, if the donation has been refunded or if it's an in-kind donation, we're not including them in this particular report. So you can um, come in and make those changes as needed. 
We also have here that we have the latest transaction date and the latest transaction amount. If you see these arrows here, this is how the report is being sorted. So maybe if I wanted to take a look at the date or sort by date, I can do that from, let's say, most recent to, to farthest back, you can. But another thing that I like about this report template and that I like pointing out is um, it also shows you the count. How many interactions have you had with this particular donor or with this particular constituent? Right. And that can kind of help inform you and give you a little bit of insight. For example, we have um, Bolivar Trask here who hasn't given to my organization since um, September of 2021. Well, maybe that's not such that's not such a surprise to me if I've only had one interaction with him um, in the last fiscal year. So this gives you a little bit insight on why the donor might have given or why that was the last time the, the donor might have given. So again, these reports are dynamic. We are going to save this report because I want to, I'm going to show you in a little bit how you can reference these reports. And again, all of these report templates are fully customizable, right? So if you're trying to, if for example, your LIBAND has, um, or maybe you've made the determination that you're going to send a paper appeal to, let's say, 100 donors, and the rest are going to receive an email. But I have this many in this particular report. So I can massage my report a little bit and change up the filters to get to the ideal number that I, that I prefer. So we are going to name this report because we are going to use this in a little bit. Very similar here um, as we also have our Cybunt report. So again, very similar, except if you take a look at the include because we're saying that um, they have given at some point in the past, we're not specifying a date range. Um, and what you can do as well is if you know that your LIBUNT 2022 that we had earlier is going to get your paper appeals and then your CIBUNTs are going to get your email appeals, I want to exclude anyone who's already in my LIBUNT report from this CIBUNT report. And the way that I can do that easily is I can click OR here and I'm going to look for report. So what I'm telling the system now is, hey, anyone who is already in this report that we created a little bit earlier, I don't want them in this report. And then we're gonna click okay. So we're gonna see our numbers go down a little bit. So once you build your um, letter appeals, we're gonna reference our LIBUNT. And once we build our email appeals, we're going to reference our CIBUNT. Again, I like starting with a report because I can see who those constituents are. And I can make those determinations of if I need to adjust any of my filters or any of my segments. So we're gonna call that our Cybent 2022 fiscal year. I know we went through that a little bit fast. If you need um, help building your reports in Bloomerang, if you're using Bloomerang, of course you can um, talk to our support team. But I wanted to show you um, those pre-built templates that you can personalize for your use. And I wanted to show you how easy it is to reference those letters, those um, reports that we just built in a letter or email. So for example, if we are building a new letter, let's say this is going to be our end of year appeal letter. We're going to click next. I'm not going to build the actual letter right now, but we did go over some tips earlier as to the content of your letter. What I want to show you is because I've built those reports, I've taken a look at them, our board has taken a look at them, and we've given the okay, yes, this is the list that we're mailing out to. 
We can start preparing our letter here. And in the filters, similar to what we did of excluding our libents from our sibents, I can go into my letter here, search for report, look for my LIBUT 2022 fiscal year. And if I need a refresher on what that report looks like, I can take a look here and see what that report looks like before clicking OK. And now what we're telling the system is, hey, anyone who was in that report, I want them to get this letter. They should get this letter. So we can save this. I'm just going to click, click Keep Editing for now because we're not actually going to send it. But it's a very easy flow of take a look at what your goals are, um, who you want to segment, build those reports, create those letters, create those emails, and then just reference those reports in your letters or emails. It's the same process for emails, so we're not um, going to take a look at that. Um, but I wanted to show you another report. So we're going to, to take a look at a way to build out reports for your matching donors. So once again, we're asking people in our database who have in some capacity shared with us who their employer is. So they either added it to a form or they told somebody, maybe they've already matched gifts and you already know who their employer is and who is matching. So we can do this a couple of different ways. Again, we are going to start with a template. And we are going to take a look at employer relationships. So this is specifically looking at anybody who has an employer-employee relationship. And I want everyone who has given a gift this calendar year. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a filter here or has transaction, specifically um, the transaction state with, was this fiscal year. So now I have a report of all employees in my database um, who have um, employers also in the database and the employees have given a gift. And if I was tracking this information, for example, I like to include this in my donation forms. Does your employer have a matching gift program? And I know that Bloomerang does match gifts. I can reach out to these donors and check if the gift, if their gift from this year has already been matched. And if it's not, or if it hasn't, then I can reach out to the donor, um, maybe give them a little nudge to get their gift matched, and give as much information to the donor as you can already. Put in your EIN, anything they might need in order for them to give to their employer to get those gifts matched. I wanted to point out here as well, so right now we don't know yet if the employer has matched or not, or the, if the employer has given a gift or not. We just know that this is a, this is a list of employees that have given gifts. But if I go in here, and if I click on this button, um, any filters I have at the top level here is going to apply to the, this group of folks. When I open this one up, it opens another set of filters. So it's kind of like Inception, if you've seen that movie, filters within filters. Now these sets of filters matches or applies to these this group. So top level filters here apply to here. Um, this level filters apply to here. So I can use that in any combination. And again, you know, you're limited to whatever information you're tracking in your database. Show me a list of employees where the employer hasn't given yet. Or show me a list of employees whose employer has a matching gift program. You can absolutely set that up in your database. Um, and um, take advantage of that. So someone's asking, can you say that filter thing again? Um, these filters apply to this group. The filters at the top level here, if we cancel out, these top level filters apply to this role. Great question.
All right, we're coming up toward the end of our time here. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the biggest giving days of the year. So typically that's your Giving Tuesday, or if you have a giving day um, specific to your state or to your area. Um, and then there's also December 30th and the 31st. If you're not really, really sure when you should be asking, this is kind of a good template. And if you've never done your event, your um, giving asks before December 30 and 31st or New Year's Eve, a lot of people will forget as the holiday season is going on that they need to get to get their year and giving in. Um, and for tax purposes, a lot of people really do feel the need to make charitable gifts at the end of the year. And also, um, just a message out there to folks again, if you didn't participate in Giving Tuesday, that's totally fine. And as you can see here, this is actually information from our, um, from one of our, from one of our products, Kindful, that you still have, um, in fact, December 31st um, outpaces Giving Tuesday in terms of the number of gifts, especially if you take a look at December 30th and 31st together. So there is still opportunity for you out there. So really remind people that this is the last giving day of the year if they wanted to count towards their tax deduction. And then if you haven't tried something like a peer-to-peer -peer challenge or texting, and that's something you kind of wanted to do or think might be helpful, or even if you've done it successfully before, this can be a really good time to do it. Do it early before the holiday celebrations get in full swing. And then frankly, doing it towards the end of the night can't hurt either because people will get really excited to give and want to really make sure they're meeting challenges and anything else you've lined up for the last two giving days of the year. So really get creative with that. And this is a good time to think outside the box because really, it's the last thing that's going to count um, for your calendar year. Uh, and again, this, this chart of um, showing the number of gifts here, what brought in their average single gift amount and their total revenue on, those, on these days across their, their different databases. So I thought these numbers were really fascinating and wanted to share with you all. So these are huge giving days and you can see that those revenue amounts aren't insane. So please don't, pass this by and think that this isn't something you can do or handle or that it's not worth it because it absolutely is. Again, just work to make sure that you're standing out from the crowd in this very crowded holiday season of giving. Outside the, of tax incentive deadlines, it's fair to conclude that the fourth quarter is the season most of us choose to give. It's a time when we're encouraged to think of others and those enduring some hardships of life in a world which gets physically and mentally more testing. So I wanted to talk about some holiday messaging and stewardship. We have some ideas on updating your website that can be really helpful. A really sweet holiday message on your landing page can be great. It gets people excited and feeling a little bit more festive. I also like the idea of updating employees employee bios or somewhere else on your page when you can do something fun. It can be kitschy, but this is the time of year for kitsch. So be totally okay with that. Maybe add board messages. Um, people oftentimes don't get a lot of board contact unless they are your biggest donors. And so spreading the love out around to everybody and having some really sweet messages or fun messages from your board can be a really great way to humanize them and to humanize them to the segment of your database that doesn't really get a lot of face time with them. And then it's also a great time to remind them of anything that you have coming up. So you can do that really fun and creative ways. You can, you can spread out who's sending them. It doesn't have to be your, major, your one major gift officer who's sitting there already overwhelmed at the end of the year. Have your board send it. Have volunteers send a thank you card or a letter that's handwritten to your lower level donors. It can be from anybody. Just make sure that you're saying happy holidays in some capacity. And when we talk about the holidays, we don't mean a specific set of holidays by any means. By better understanding the wide cultural re roots of the season of generosity, we can fine tune the means to communicate with all who make up our communities. 
The holidays means many different things to different populations and becoming aware of other holiday traditions lessens the likelihood of alienating supporters by being unintentionally culturally insensitive. So whatever the year-end fundraising strategies look like to your nonprofit, we can take a look at how the season of giving looks to different groups in our culturally rich communities, wherever you are. And at the core, humanity is about celebration and generosity, and few organizations do that better than nonprofits. Now, in terms of stewardship, you are going to have some awesome ideas on stewardship as well. So make sure you're adding that to the chat <laughs> um, if you have some ideas and, and check that out. Be sure you're making your thank you calls. You should absolutely be doing that at the end of the year. Fun holidays videos either on your website or on in your emails can be a lot of fun. Um, I've just, I've been keeping all the messages I've been getting um, from this last quarter just because they've been so much fun and I want to use them as examples and share them with you. You know, you could even have something where your staff is sharing New Year's resolutions or some of your um, constituents, if that's appropriate for them to be out in front of people and share what they want to do in the new year. And then think about how you can surprise and delight your constituents. You can maybe host um, like a virtual happy hour or some, some other sort of Zoom event. Um, or if it makes sense, if you have a venue where you can bring people in safely and do something like that and just do something fun. It's not necessarily a donor event. It doesn't have to be a solicitation event. You're just doing something fun. You can do something around random acts of kindness, different ways to pay it forward. So really think about um, how you can make things fun and have your plan in place. And then I also recommend, I know we've been talking a lot about year end, but start your year off right. Sending a newsletter, if you've never done a newsletter, um, a New Year's newsletter, is a, it's a really great time for it. Encourage your donors to start the year off right with a gift. You know, again, we need to be stewarding. So say thank you for everything that they did and helped you achieve in the previous year and make sure that you're thinking that people, um, even if are thanking people, even if they haven't given this year for listening, for being a part of your mailing list, for making, for not opting out. Some people um, might not be in a place to give, but reminding them of the good work that you're doing and that they've helped with um, is really going to go a lot toward keeping you top of mind where when they can get to a place where they can give in the future. So here are some last minute year end fundraising strategies as well. I've linked a guide here that everybody is going to get a copy of. Um, try to prioritize strategies based on potential for highest yield. So we gave the example of your lie buns and your side buns. Um, make the telephone your friend. And again, if you don't have the bandwidth, if you don't have a big staff, can you get volunteers involved? Segment out your best laps donors. Segment all your mailings by areas where improvement is needed. Which areas can use a little bit more love? Uh, plan as carefully for email as for direct mail. Get your mailing list ready. Build a multi-channel strategy as well. So you can mix and match those different channels. Um, you're going to get great success with that, or you're going to find what works for your constituents and what they respond to. We have a lot of resources to share with everyone. Um, and before, as I'm sharing the resources, I also wanted to put up a poll. If you'd like a follow-up to learn more about how Bloomerang can help you in your organization, let us know in the poll. But um, these are the resources I've talked about earlier. So we have a lot of um, nonprofit success webinars. This is more appropriate now for next year if you want to get a head start on Giving Tuesday. And again, how you can fold that in your end of year strategy, those are great to check out. We have the recordings um, already, and I'll link those here. We also have this new donor cultivation timeline. I love this. So this gives you a timeline, um, what to do after you've gotten that first gift, all the way to getting the donor to your second gift or to their second gift. 
Um, again, all of these resources are linked here. If you need a little bit of help crafting your actual appeal letters, I have some resources here as well. Um, um, here's some resources on matching gifts. Um, in previous webinars that I've done, I've seen um, more people have experience um, with matching gifts. So if this is if you if this is something you haven't done before, definitely definitely worth looking into. I always um, like learning from everyone else as well. So if there's any resources that have been shared in the chat, um, we'll make sure to include those in these slides. These resources that you're seeing on the screen right now are resources that came from fundraisers like you, who whenever I do a, a webinar, I ask folks for resources so I can share that out and spread the love to everyone as well. So you are going to get a copy of these slides and you'll have access to these resources as well. And that's about all the time we have today. I'm just taking a look if we, if we have any other unanswered questions. There's a question here. Part of our Giving Tuesday was through Facebook. Those funds will come in 2023, so we will book it as receivable. When we get the funds, do you suggest adding the names individually? If you have the donor information, absolutely add them individually. And what that will allow you to do is really steward the donor, right? You don't want that gift through Facebook to be a one-time thing. So if you can get your name, if you can get their contact information, you can start stewarding those donors and, and build that stronger relationship. Great question. All right. Looks like that's it for today. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. I hope this has been helpful for you. I see a couple of folks have put in um, their um, email addresses in there. If there is any resources that was shared into the chat, I'll also add them in these slides, and we can all benefit from them. So thank you again. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I hope I see you in another nonprofit success webinar soon. Have a lovely day. Bye.